You want to get that car? Just pray to Hajjaj and you will get it. You wanting to get married? Just pray to Hajjaj and you will get it. You want that dream house? Or just pray to Hajjaj and you will get it. No, no, no. Stop it's right there. Tahajjud is not manifestation. One big misconception that I've seen throughout social media is that if you pray to Hajjaj, whatever you dream or desire, will happen overnight or in the next 48 hours or in a very short period of time. I think this is very misleading. It can be true for some people, but it's not a universal truth. What happens is if you pray to Hijid and whatever you dream or desire doesn't happen overnight or in a short period of time, you will give up, stop praying, you will lose hope and also trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't want that, okay? So I've been praying Tahajjud for three years now and it completely changed my life. I want you to experience the same peace and tranquility that I feel when I'm praying Tahajjud. So in this video, I will tell you how to pray Tahajjud, when to pray Tahajjud, why it's so important and how it can change your life. Here are my video chapters. Feel free to jump around, but I would advise to watch until the end. Now we're talking about the time between Salatul Aisha and Salatul Fajr. This is the night time between the nighttime prayer and the morning prayer. Now, if you pray before you sleep, we usually call this Qiyam al-Layl. And if you sleep and then wake up, we usually call this Tahajjud. How do you pray it? If you're going to pray Qiyam al-Layl, you can stand up and make intention for two extra rak'ah, and you just pray two rak'ahs. And then you can sleep, or you can sleep after Aisha, or do, do the dishes or whatever you do, and then you go to bed, wake up before Fajr. Now, simplest, you can wake up even 15 minutes before Fajr, and just make wudu and pray two rak'ahs of tahajjud, and then you wait for the Fajr prayer and you pray. That's the simplest, that's the basic. Two rak'ahs of tahajjud. Now, here we have also Salatul Witr. Okay, so Witr is our a very strong sunnah, and it's meant to be prayed at night. So the next step we can say is we're gonna wake up just a tiny bit earlier, pray two rak'ahs of sunnah to tahajjud, and then pray Witr, depending on if you're praying at which method you're praying, you're going to pray all three rak'ahs together, or two and then one. Now, what has the Prophet told us about the numbers of rakahs to pray at night? We have interest, many different uh, narrations that talk about the number of rakahs. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu tells us that the Prophet would pray 11 rakahs, that's 8 plus 3, the 8 rakahs of tahajjud plus 3 of witr, 8 being 2, 2, 2, 2. Now, I really want to emphasize thinking about habit growing. 2, then I'm going to do 4, then I'm going to do 6, and then I'm going to do 8. Now, maybe I'm doing 8, maybe now I want to expand each of these rakahs and make each one longer. Maybe I'll just do four, but I'll make them longer. Or maybe I'll do something else. Here are a few ideas of things to do at night. Our community, one of the things that our community is struggling with is missed prayers. A really beautiful way to use the night is to make up your followed prayers. So at night, even WhatsApp stops working. Here is a time to have a balanced prayer. To recite, to settle in your ruku'ah, settle in your sujood. And one other really important part of tahajjud is du'a. Prayer at night is a time to really develop that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So having new things to do is a good idea, but also take, take note of the environment. Set up your prayer place the other day for yourself. It's something about knowing where you're going to go. Light a candle. Spray some perfume in the area or incense, whatever it is that you like to bring beautiful smells. Make some cookies in the middle of the night. Make, uh, bring some cinnamon rolls and open it up so that smell is filling the air. And make it a place of cleanliness. Make sure your prayer clothes are clean. Make sure the prayer carpet is something easy to sit on. If you are not able to do sujood, you have knee issues or a broken leg or something, then have a chair that's comfortable. Pay attention to these things. Get the place ready so that when you wake up, your appointment, your meeting with your Lord is prepared. You're just beautifying yourself with wudu and you're going to that prayer carpet. You begin with rak'atain, two light rak'ahs. And you, have, you do these two rakahs, and you, they're very lightweight. That means they're not very long. That's how the Prophet would do it. And then the next ones are longer. You, you've warmed up. It's like exercise, exercise of the heart, exercise of the spirit. You've warmed up, and then you extend that, and then you sit and make du'a. And if you're a person who can't think about what to make du'a for, make notes during the day and set that next to you so that you can look at it and remember to make du'a for me. Remember to make du'a for our ummah. Remember to make du'a for your children, your family, for all of the people that you know and don't know. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide, support, help, cure, send his mercy down, forgive all of those that we love, and those that are close to us, and those who are far and make tahajjud and pray for ourselves that we make tahajjud a habit for us, that that prayer becomes the thing we long for and hope for and enjoy deeply. When you stand at night and pray, imagine, imagine these two things. Imagine first that you are standing as in, in the footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that you are standing and calling out for help for your own Badr and for our community Badr. And imagine as well that you too have the angels descending to listen to you as you recite and call out. Imam Shafi'i, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with him, he would say the arrow that is shot at night doesn't miss its mark. Believe me, he wasn't talking about archery. He was talking about du'a. That du'a is indeed the arrow of the night. That when we stand up to pray at night and we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask not only for the things we need, though these are things to ask for, but also for what we need as a community. We can grow to Maqam al-Mahmuda. We can grow to the community that we need to be. All the work that we are doing is important and blessed. And tahajjud is the place where our heart wakes up and where our heart rests is the thing we do that is extra for the one that we worship. Nafila is not just the fard, it's standing up to do that extra thing. And tahajjud is the most important nafila. It's the most important sunnah. Tahajjud helps us to grow individually, to become of those who Allah loves. And also, as a community, think about that verse, becoming of those who have maqam and mahmuda, an elevated status. The importance of tahajjud 
is in walking the path of becoming of the beloved, of becoming of those who have a heart that it's easier to love with this heart. Stand up at night and follow in the path, listening to the Prophet Sallam when he was asked, what are the best of deeds? If shu salam, give greetings of peace, feed people. Stand up at night while people are sleeping. People get up and pray to Hajjah in this day and age. And of course, subhanAllah, most of the lights were out. And I would think about one of the tabi'een and what he would say, that the angels look down upon the earth and they see the homes of those who pray to Hajjud as shining stars. Just as we look up at the sky and we see those shining stars and they are lights for us and think about those who are in, like, go out to the countryside and look at the stars, not from the city. As I said, Tahajud has changed my life. Not all the things that I made dua for came true yet. Actually, the dua that started me off on this Tahajud journey hasn't come true yet. However, others did. One most prominent got true after three months. It was flabbergasting my mind. Other than that, what I have lost is impatience, depression, anxiety, perfectionism, procrastination, negative thinking, and impulsivity. I've gained a trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and peace in my heart, like tranquility and contentment with where and who I am. I feel so connected to him and I'm glad that he has given me the opportunity to be able to pray and ask him in the first place. Not all of your doers will come true in this life, but you will lose and gain so much from it that you can't even gain anywhere else. Not even therapy, and I have been to a good therapist. Not saying don't go, yet this alone won't solve and change you. So I'm telling you firsthand, pray to Hijud. So here's what happens if you do as actually and when things are made open and clear. Wouldn't you want to know why certain things were withheld from you? What happens when Allah reminds you as you're standing before Him, remember that thing you kept asking me for? Remember that spouse you wanted? Remember that career or position you were after? Calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with certainty in His ability to do things for you, you're calling upon Him with certainty in His knowledge to do what's best for you. You're also acknowledging your limitation of understanding what's actually best for you. The remember, dua is composed of two things. Thana, which is the praise of Allah, and talab, which is the request from Allah. The scholars say that the thana part, which is the praise that you put forth throughout your dua, it's always stored for the hereafter. As for the talab, which is the request, that part is distributed between both this dunya and the akhirah, this life and the next, so sometimes it's going to be delayed. So the rewards of all the remembrance of Allah that was part of your dua is showing up in your record, and if that was all, that would be sufficient. Then the Prophet ﷺ goes on to say, relating to the talab itself, to the ask itself, he says, there is no Muslim who calls upon Allah so long as it's not a sinful ask or the cutting off of family ties, but that Allah will give him one of three things. Allah might quickly fulfill your ask. Or Allah will divert an evil away from him similar to it. Or Allah will store it for him like a treasure in the hereafter. They said, that's the case, Ya Rasulullah, we're going to keep on asking. Prophet said, Allahu Akbar, Allah is more. Keep on asking. Allah has even more than what you ask of Him, no matter how much you ask. The point is, every single time you ask Him sincerely, Allah is going to respond with so much more. And so, what is it like when you're standing in front of Allah and Allah says, Remember when you asked me for this and that? Here's what I've turned that into for you here. Here's the beauty of it that the ulama mentioned. Let's say that you're sick and you and 150 people make dua a bunch of times for you to be cured, but you're not cured in this dunya. Every single one of those du'as was accepted for you as a treasure in the hereafter. Now it might be that Allah in His mercy lets the sickness go and then He still cures you at some point. So let's say that 500 du'as were made for a cure. Now 499 of them were stored in the hereafter as treasure. But then that last one went to your cure in this dunya as well. The point is, as you're standing there on the Day of Judgment and you're seeing these stored treasures of du'as showing up in your books of deeds, let me tell you what you're not doing. You are not wishing that those du'as were answered in this dunya. You're saying, Alhamdulillah, Allah left them for here where they mean so much more. Not like, Ya Allah, can you let me go back and get that job or that spouse or whatever it is that you were asking for? You are wishing at this point that all of your du'as were answered for the hereafter. And so you trust your Lord with your du'as. It's very similar to the way that you trust your Lord with your charity. You loan Him your donations in this world and Allah gives it back to you as what? As a mountain of gold in the hereafter. So how many du'as have you deposited in this dunya? And what type of treasures will you see from Allah, who never failed to hear you, he never failed to answer you, and he never fails to reward you in ways that you could never imagine. Side note, if you're unaware of manifestation, it's disbelief coming from the self-help industry that if you want something, you just have to believe in it and it will happen. By you sending out will frequencies, law of attraction, the universe will know what you want and grant it to you. There are concepts that align with our faith like intention setting, power thinking, belief, 
visualization, affirmation, action, patience and persistence. Yet prayer and supplication, trusting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and decision making, which is istihara, asking Allah for the right guidance, are kind of missing in this equation. Additionally, the thing is you don't know if what you dreamed of or made the while about is going to happen or not. And something you think is good for you may not be good for you and vice versa. It also takes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of the equation because we have prayers like is there our tahajjud for that. There you go. This is in my opinion everything you need to know about tahajjud for beginners. Go easy on yourself. Trust if you want to hear other success story, make sure to check out the comment section below in this video. Additionally, if you need something to write your duas on, make sure to get my salah journal on a tahajjud is or do a notepad. And stay tuned for my new newsletter. Check out the description below and Barakalahum Fiki for coming this far and see you in my next one, inshallah.